I'm David Waring. I uh, research here, research British foreign policy in the Middle East, um, particularly the Gulf. I uh, teach Middle East politics, international political economy, and I'm the author of a recent report on UK arms sales to Israel, which was published by War and Want, Palestine Solidarity Campaign and Campaign Against Arms Trade, on whose steering committee I sit. Um, nuclear arms, nuclear weapons, very much in the news at the moment in the UK, and I'm sure most of you are aware there's uh, what will hopefully be a very large march against Trident Renewal plans uh, in London tomorrow, 12 o'clock, Marble Arch. Um, so it's a good time to be talking about this, and us being so ass, we are all about giving space to dissenting voices, and we have a great dissenting voice here today. Um, I'll introduce the panel briefly, and then we'll, uh, we'll get on. Um, right next to me is Rebecca Sharkey. She's the UK coordinator for the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, um, of which the Israel, Israeli disarmament movement is a partner organization. Next to her is Dan Plesch from the Center of International Studies and Diplomacy here at SOAS. Uh, Dan has published extensively for many years on international security issues, on WMD and the creation of WMD free zones. And the far end of the, of the table is our star guest, Sharon Lev, the founder and director of the Israeli disarmament movement, a uh, former director of Greenpeace in Israel and an experienced peace and human rights activist. So I'm going to first hand over to Rebecca and she's going to give you a, a, more, a fuller introduction to, to today's talk. Hi. Um, so I'm going to just tell you a bit about ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, of which uh, Sharon and I are both uh, campaigners and a few people here as well. Uh, and so in 2010, um, the International Red Cross made a statement at the UN saying that there was no possible um, scenario in which they could provide an adequate response to a nuclear weapon detonation, and nor could any uh, organization or government. And this uh, statement triggered a whole sort of new way of approaching the issue of nuclear weapons, looking at it through a humanitarian lens. And that's developed into what we're now calling the Humanitarian Initiative. Um, it's about taking the nuclear weapons out of their box of being something that only is talked about by security experts in nuclear weapon states and making it something that is an issue for everybody and that all countries, all governments and all people around the world should have a say in. Um, and so there have been three main major government level conferences, fact-based conferences looking at the humanitarian and environmental impact of nuclear weapons hosted by the governments of Norway, Mexico, and more recently, Austria. Um, and that has been developing more recently by uh, resolutions at the United Nations in December, uh, which voted uh, majority to hold, ne nego not negotiations yet, talks that are taking place this week um, at the UN in Geneva, um, open-ended working group, and to take forward really some concrete measures um, to fill the legal gap. That's the phrase that people are using. The, uh, the NPT, which is the major treaty um, looking at nuclear disarmament, mainly nuclear non-proliferation, um, is quite vague in its language. And that's resulted in countries like the UK and Israel is a bit more opaque about it. But, but being able to say that we somehow have a right to, to keep nuclear weapons and that they're essential for our security. Um, we're proposing at ICANN, and this is being taken up by more and more countries, uh, a new nuclear weapon ban treaty. So this, negotiations for this treaty are now in the pipeline. The UK is boycotting uh, these UN mandated talks, um, as is Israel, um, but they're gonna go ahead anyway, because the new approach is uh, to go ahead with all of the countries without nuclear weapons, um, which are the vast majority of countries in the world, and um, make nuclear weapons clearly illegal uh, under, under international humanitarian law. They're the only WMD which are not currently explicitly illegal. Um, so we think that this uh, new treaty is going to have a really big impact across the world on nuclear weapon states as well, even if they don't sign up. 
um, to stigmatise nuclear weapons and de delegitimise them. Um, and ICANN is, uh, have been around since about 2007. We have campaigners in 100 countries. Um, the vast majority of these are in non-nuclear weapon states. Um, and then there's a, uh, some of us are in nuclear armed states. Um, and the strategy has been mainly aimed at the non-nuclear weapon states and encouraging them to speak out um, and actually just open negotiations. So Sharon and I have uh, been in the handful of campaigners really who are in uh, the nuclear weapon states. So when we've been at the UN, for example, um, doing lobbying, diplomats and things, we've been <laughs> a couple of times, uh, we've, all the campaigners get different countries to lobby um, and we've been given the nuclear armed states, which has been quite interesting. So we've been, we've been had uh, little chats with with the Russians and the Chinese and the Americans and the Brits, and on occasion um, with the Israelis as well. Um, they don't obviously go to their NPT meetings because they're not a signatory state of the NPT uh, treaty, but they are there at the first committee um, of the United Nations, but they're not used to being talked to. So <laughs> um, it was <laughs> we, they were kind of a bit shocked and uh, surprised when we went to talk to them and. Uh, encouraging them to take part in this new initiative. Um, and uh, yeah, it, was, it was an unusual sort of situation. Um, so we share this um, sort of approach of, of pushing for a nuclear weapon ban treaty that's gonna happen without the nuclear weapon states. And whenever I think that it's difficult campaigning in this country, um, which it is, um, because we grow up thinking that having nuclear weapons is normal, and that we need them for our security. Um, and then whenever I think how hard that is, I think about Sharon campaigning in Israel, and it's just a completely taboo subject. You're not allowed to talk about it. Um, so how on earth can you go about campaigning against something that people won't even talk about? Um, so a huge admiration for Sharon's determination at opening up debate, getting people even just to talk about this subject is fantastically difficult. And I, I'm really impressed with how uh, Sharon's taken the humanitarian approach um, and applied it to her country, reminding people what these weapons really are and what they actually do and their impact on people's lives and on their environments. Um, so one thing which I think we'll be able to show you a clip from, um, Sharon uh, arranged for a group of um, Hibakusha, survivors of the uh, bombs in Japan, to visit Israel and meet with a group of Holocaust survivors, um, which I, when I first found out about this, I was really moved, and well, I still am very moved by it. Um, I think it, huh? <laughs> it sends an extraordinarily powerful humanitarian message about how we're, all of these people were victims of the Second World War and of the, the dark, dark times that humanity went through, um, and we don't tolerate Nazism anymore, and actually we shouldn't tolerate weapons of mass destruction. Um, so I think that made a very powerful connection. And she also brought um, an expert on the environmental and climatic impacts of nuclear weapons, Dr. Helfand, over from America, in an absolutely groundbreaking um, discussion at the Israeli parliament. It was the first time that nuclear weapons had ever been discussed in the Knesset. And it was because it was this facts-based approach um, looking at the impact on environment and, and people. Um, so it's, this approach is really helping to, to engage people and overcome kind of political, uh, party political machinations and national concerns and think, remind people about the, the global concerns and think about this in an international way. Um, so I, I really um, take my hat off to Sharon and <laughs> Um, and maybe we can show the, the film from the, the survivors' meetings. Thanks, Richard. כחצי מיליון אישה ואיש מתו כתוצאה מהטלת הפצצה הגרעינית על ירושימה באוגוסט 1945. מעל 100,000 מתו בימים שלאחר הטלת הפצצה, ועוד מאות אלפים בשנים שלאחר מכן כתוצאה מנזקי הקרינה. במהדורה הקודמת סיקרנו את ביקורה של משלחת ניצולי ירושימה בכותל. בכתבה הבאה, מפגש מרגש של המשלחת עם ניצולי שואה ביד ושם. 
זוהי הגברת, תושידה קזומי. היא הייתה רק בת ארבע כשהפצצה נפלה במרחק שני קילומטר מביתה. היא איבדה את כל משפחתה ומכריה. הנחת הזר ביד ושם לזכרו של חסיד אומות העולם, סמפו סוגיהרה, היה רגע מרגש במיוחד עבורה. היא סיפרה שסוגיהרה, שהיה קונסול יפני, העניק בתקופת השואה אלפי אשרות ליהודים, בניגוד להוראות שקיבל ממפקדיו. הוא מסמל בעיניה כי גם בלב הזוועה תמיד יש ניצוץ של תקווה. אימא בקול גדול צעקה, עזרה, עזרה. ואז האחות שלה, שהייתה עם כוויות נוראיות, אחרי שלושה שבועות נפטרה. לאח שלה, שקוראים לי סאשי, כל הזמן אימא חיכתה, במשך שבועות היא חיכתה וכל תזוזה בדלת, היא הייתה בטוחה וקוראת לי סאשי, סאשי זה אתה. והוא אף פעם לא הגיע, אף פעם לא נמצא, ולא נמצא שום שארית מהגוף שלו שכנראה נשרף לחלוטין. למרות שבמלחמת העולם השנייה לחמו היפנים לצד גרמניה הנאצית, הטרגדיה המזוויעה שבהטלת הפצצה הגרעינית יצרה מעין שותפות גורל בין ניצולי הפצצה הגרעינית לניצולי השואה היהודים. ב-1945, בזמן הטלת הפצצה, נסעתי ברכבת בירושימה, הייתי בן 16. פתאום, תקרת הקרון קרנה בצבע כחול, למזלי הייתי קרוב לפתח היציאה של הרכבת ויכולתי מיידית לקפוץ החוצה. ופתאום משב רוח חזק מהפצצה, נשב עליי והעיף אותי. כשעברנו בבריחה שלנו לכיוון הרכבת שהייתה פתוחה, ראינו מחזות מזעזעים של אנשים מלאים בכוויות, שהאור שלהם כולו נמס למטה, ונראים כמו אנשים שאינם בני אדם, שצורת הגוף שלהם השתנה, וכולם הולכים כמו יצורים לא אנושיים. אמנם ניצלתי מהזוועות האלה, אבל עד היום אני לא יכול לשכוח את מה שאני ראיתי. בהמשך השבוע קיימו ניצולי ראשים מסדרת מפגשים פתוחים לקהל. במפגשים הם חלקו את סיפורם האישי והדגישו את מסר השלום. Thank you. I think that's a good introduction to um, just one of the aspects of Sharon's work, and I'm sure we'll hear more about the rest. Before handing over to, uh, to Sharon Dole, I just wanted to say a few words. Um, my name is Dan Plesh. I'm the director of the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy here at SOAS. Uh, please, at the end, don't forget to pick up the various bits of uh, educational material from our different uh, projects and campaigns. I just want to say uh, uh, two or three words about our own work on this topic in the centre um, and how I've came, come across uh, and had small opportunities in the past to work with uh, uh, Sharon. Um, 
When I first came to SOAS, uh, having worked for a long time on weapons of mass destruction issues, but without particularly a regional focus, um, I thought, what project might we open up? And the project which I started then was the first in any uh, Western public institution to have a public debate about weapons of mass destruction free zone. Because broadly speaking, uh, the State of Israel uh, was highly hostile to having this discussed in public fora. Uh, although in private, there had long been uh, what in the jargon people call informal or twin track discussions. And we just started with some presumption uh, to invite all the ambassadors from the Arab states in Israel and the P5 from the UN uh, to come and speak about the topic. And uh, after some surprise, the Arab states, Egypt, started coming and started speaking at deputy foreign minister level. And after a couple of years of that, the British and the Americans kind of decided they, it was too embarrassing not to show up. And although the Israelis never came, uh, the P5 came increasingly. And then after we'd had these discussions, um, suddenly Chatham House and the European Union decided that they too could have a public discussion about the idea of a WMD free zone. And while we have certainly haven't got one, um, the, the work that we did here at SOAS, I think is worth noting not simply because how wonderful we were to do this, but actually how very easy it was. That we just had to make the political decision as an institution that we would talk about a topic. And things started to change politically. And in the end, uh, President Obama's special representative on uh, proliferation issues came from the White House, her name was Susan Burke, from the White House to speak at uh, the conference in the run-up to the 2010 meeting of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So that's to give some sense of the institutional background in the center on the topic, and also to illustrate that actually by breaking taboo topics, um, which is a lot easier for us to do in uh, London than in uh, Israel, but nevertheless, you know, this is a topic that at the time, King's College and Chatham House and Oxford and Cambridge could not bring themselves to have a discussion about in public, although they would have it in, in, in private. Of course, uh, I got a taste um, of the day-to-day -day experience that uh, Sharon has when with the uh, Palestine-Israel journal, we published, which is based in East Jerusalem, uh, we published a special issue on the zone. Um, and they organized a conference. And only afterwards did I realize that having secured the uh, uh, offices in the Vatican papal uh, complex in Jerusalem, that this was kind of actually a, an insurance policy against having the Israeli security police storm the conference, or at least stop it. Um, and we had one of the first public discussions in, uh, in Israel on the topic. But in the course of these various meetings, I got to know um, Sharon and uh, have always hugely admired her work for its intellectual integrity uh, and depth when so many people are just sort of content to wave banners and shout slogans, even if they have a good point, uh, but don't take it uh, into the, uh, the policy engagement depth with officials and others um, that needs to happen. And uh, Sharon does all of that and more in very difficult uh, political and personal circumstances. Um, so I'm delighted that we can welcome um, her here. We have a, a larger and even, one might say, less unlike, uh, even more unlikely project called Scrap Weapons. There are leaflets at the back about a, a revived general approach to disarmament. And this came partly, because, although it had, now has an august group of uh, uh, former ambassadors engaged with it and strong support within the UN system. The reason, one of the reasons that led us to start that program was that in discussions with countries in the region, in the Middle East, about the bomb in the Middle East, it was, well, why pick on us? You know, the Israelis would say, well, you know, no one's talking about the France getting rid of its weapons or French weapons of mass destruction. Why are you talking to us? And then they'd say, you'd say, well, because you're a particularly dangerous region. <laughs> and we're concerned about proliferation. 
But this doesn't really wash. If there isn't a global discussion about control, as, as uh, Rebecca also represents, and we talk not just about the bomb, but about the sort of conventional weapons we see devastating Syria at the moment, that if there isn't a global conversation, then it's very hard to have regional and local, or even harder to have the local and regional conversations. Uh, so that's why we uh, developed the wider project. Um, but with that uh, advertising um, shtick over, can I um, uh, hand over for, um, to, to, to Sharon to talk to us about her projects, uh, her work and, and perceptions on what has to be you know, definitively one of the um, most difficult issues in global politics at the present time. Sharon. Thank you, Dan, and thank you all for having me and you for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it. You know, it's, it's usually I have to push to say something, and here I was actually welcomed. <laughs> it's not a usual uh, experience. Um, to complain about nuclear weapons is a hard job everywhere, unless maybe you are in Scandinavia. And <laughs> even then, it's, sometimes it's hard. The thing is, and what makes it a bit harder in Israel, is that if you all know that Israel is a nuclear armed state, in Israel we're not supposed to say it. Now, the funny thing is, it's not illegal, but everybody thinks it's illegal. If it was legal or illegal to say it, we could have just fought, fight the law, but we don't have to fight a law. We have to fight a taboo, a belief. And the belief is that by having this thing, that because we have this thing we are not talking about, this black spot we're not talking about, we still exist. That's the common belief. But even stronger than this is the belief that by not thinking about it, not talking about it, not criticizing, not thinking about it at all, we're keeping Israel safe. By not asking questions, we're keeping Israel safe about this thing we're not talking about. So. How do you campaign against that? And the problem is, another problem, is that there are some nuclear experts in Israel. I mean, how do we have bombs if we don't have experts? We have <laughs> some experts on nuclear policies, but they're all within the establishment or working very closely with the establishment. How do we start a campaign when we really don't know anything? We're not experts. Um, I'm definitely not an expert. And when I started, I knew nothing. I knew that nuclear bombs have this mushroom cloud that they are horrible, immoral, and that's more or less what I knew. I also knew that I want to do whatever I can to abolish them. I thought it's impossible. Lucky for me, Greenpeace International decided that they want to spread their campaign to Israel. And I was lucky enough to hear about it, and I offered myself and they hired me, not because there was so much competition, not many other people in Israel wanted to work in this position. Greenpeace Israel definitely didn't want that campaign in their offices. And my first mission, uh, it was what the international crew called my hidden objective, was in half a year to make the office accept the campaign. And it was totally by accident that they accepted the campaign. It's just that we had such a fun first activity that just because they had real fun, they accepted it. And the activity was something that you probably heard about, maybe you heard me talk about it three times already, Rebecca heard it about 10 times, mm -hmm. But we just had a great break. The University of Tel Aviv, with the support of all the military industri uh, industries, was organizing a series of, of events, of conferences, about nuclear weapons. Now, you say, you just said that you're not talking about it. That's not entirely true. We talk about it a lot, if it has the name Iran attached to it. So there was two main conferences, one called the Nuclear Challenge in the Middle East, and the one following it called Survival. And the first one 
was from 9 to 6, from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., with not even one woman speaker and not one speaker that challenged that, that, that challenged the perception that when you talk about Iran, maybe you can add Israel into the talks mm -hmm. and maybe you can talk about disarmament and not just about armament and disarmament. And what we did was to call the university and offer them that I'll come and speak. I was terrified of doing that, but because I didn't know anything. But we offered, we offered that I'll come and speak to show that in a university, when you have a, a whole day of a discussion, you can show the other perspective. The first speaker of that conference was President Peres, also known as the father of the nuclear program in Israel outside of Israel maybe, but he's the one that started it. And he was the president. We knew that the media will be inside because the president is speaking. So we decided that since uh, our kindly offer that I'll come and speak was rejected, with laughter by the way, that we will come and that we will do something that will get on TV because they won't be able not to show it we had all kinds of ideas, but we knew that we have to get close to the president so we can be in front of the cameras without looking as a threat, because if you run towards a sitting president, his guards might shoot you. And we didn't want to get shot. The <laughs> decision was to look as unthreatening as possible. And the only way you can really look unthreatening is if you conceal nothing, meaning you take off your clothes. So what we did, we snuck into the conference room. It was 400, 500 people, all ex-military, ex-foreign ministry, ex-defense um, uh, ministry, and so on. And we, we scattered around the room with banners that we concealed very nicely because they did look very carefully in our possessions, but we managed to conceal them. The idea was that since we don't know what, how it's going to be, when the time is right, as the campaigner, I'll stand up and I'll start yelling our message while all the guards run to me, and that's what happened. While all the guards ran to me, our activists around the room took off their clothes. They had messages on their stomachs, and, when, and other activists and them opened the banners saying stripping the Middle East of nuclear weapons and stripping the Middle East from weapons of mass destruction. Of course, all the guards ran to me, dragged me out, another campaigner stood or another activist stood from the other side of the, of the hall, continued exactly from where I left. When, when he was uh, taken out, another campaigner st standing even closer to the president finished what she had to say. She, we, she, we, we did it so well, she even had to improvise a bit. But what happened after that was, of course, they dragged all of us outside. What happened after that, that we were standing outside and we thought it didn't work. No one came outside, no reporter. We did this big action. First time in Israel there's such an action and no one came outside. However, AP and Reuters were inside and they were talking about it. Sending, they, they were sending photographs and, and images from within. In this one hour, what we didn't know, that it was on Iranian TV, New Zealand TV, Argentinian TV. The Argentinian TV we knew because one of the activists was from Argentina and suddenly his mother calling him from Argentina and said, Ariel, can it be that I just saw you naked? And it was on BBC, on Fox News, on CNN, and that was, that was in one hour. In this hour, the Israeli media realized that they cannot ignore it, and after one hour, suddenly, they wanted to talk to us. They were not kind, they were not happy about it, but they, they did talk to us. Um, we went on TV, we could, for the first time, speak about it. For the next conference, survival, they did invite me to speak. They were not kind. It wasn't the nicest experience to speak there. I was talking about 
the humanitarian catastrophe, what happened if there's a nuclear, limited nuclear bomb, and about nuclear famine, about the research that shows the amount of, of death from, from, um, from starvation, um, the, the catastrophic results about the international campaign, about states now demanding a nuclear ban and so on. The guy that was speaking in the panel next uh, uh, with me was talking about digging, how if Tel Aviv uh, will have under Tel Aviv underneath it, like digging down, um, that that's the way to survive a nuclear war. He was the sane one, I was the insane one. I was totally discarded and his, the questions to him were how deep shall we dig and how wide. But this is how we started and we really, we still didn't have a clue of where we want to go with this. I mean, we knew we wanted nuclear abolition, but we didn't know how to start talking about it. How do you persuade? Mayors for Peace asked us to, um, to represent them in Israel. So we said yes, of course. We wrote letters to all the mayors in Israel. Um, we just basically sent the formal uh, Mayors for Peace invitations for mayors to join. We translated it to Hebrew and we got maybe two letters back. It was the first trial. The second trial, we tried again. What happened if 100 bombs the size of Hiroshima will detonate? In 2007, that's how the, the ICANN campaign started, the international campaign. They, it, it was even called then 100 Hiroshimas. What happens if just 100 bombs the size of Hiroshima will detonate in a bomb between India and Pakistan? And we, we, we finished it with cities should never be targets, and we got about 60 mayors from Israel joining mayors for peace. We knew that that's the, that's the way. Now we knew. That was uh, an experiment on a small group of people, but it worked. And we knew that the international approach is the one that we should continue with. We, don't, we didn't have experts of our own to speak and to sit with us, <clears throat> so the, we imported them. I have to say that we had one year with budget, and with this year with budget, we did amazing things. We brought the Hibakusha to Israel, and they've been in the media, they've been, they've been meeting members of parliament, they've been meeting uh, just a closed media for the press and so on, and, and they were meeting activists, activists that then join us at least on, on some events. We had also a good uh, opportunity uh, to bring, as Rebecca said before, Dr. Ira Helfand, the co-chair of, uh, of uh, International Ph Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War to the Israeli parliament. And uh, he was speaking with parliamentarian deeply into, into with, with many details. It was a very good discussion about what happens when there's nuclear war, how nuclear wars can happen. Uh, you can watch some of the discussion that he had afterwards with one of the really more right-winger members of parliament in a YouTube video called Good Versus Evil. Um, that, was, that was the right-winger uh, MP uh, approach, Good Versus Evil. We, of course, called the video Good Versus Evil because we thought that good was, the prevention of war <laughs> evil was to think that nuclear weapons are okay. But realizing that there are no experts and realizing that we cannot just keep importing them, uh, especially because we went, ran out of funds, we realized that we have to start behaving like a think tank ourselves. And to do so, we started a series of uh, round tables. And it wasn't easy, but at the end, and Elizabeth Waterstone here was um, in one of them, right? Um, in these round tables, we managed to bring people that we never thought that would come to our invitation, but uh, people from the foreign ministries, people from the, the committee, uh, and I'm talking about the Atomic Agency Committee, um, people from think tanks, those who are advising the government to sit with us together so we can map the obstacles for a weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East. And that started 
a slow process that is now peaking, and that's to talk about what our plans, and the peak now is that we're actually writing a draft treaty. It's a slow process because we want to own the process. And by owning the process, I mean, this time we want people from the Middle East writing a treaty that the states say is impossible. The states haven't, haven't decided on an agenda yet. They, the states haven't, that doesn't have the goodwill to go there. We want to, buy, to, to bypass these obstacles and to write the treaty. And once we have a draft treaty, we have a product. And this product will be the center of our campaign. We hope it will be a tool for other international or national campaigners uh, around the world. I'll talk to Dan about it, and, and we're going to do some of the roundtables following this, uh, this draft treaty here with SOS. Our biggest adventure to come, apart from writing a draft treaty, is that we decided to challenge ambiguity, but also to challenge um, the legislation status in Israel. We do have um, nu a nuclear energy commission, like the IAEA, the local IAEA. Only, I don't know if you know that, Israel doesn't have nuclear energy. This commission, is the one in charge of all nuclear facilities in Israel. The only place you find it in the Israeli legislation is, for example, in laws like the radioactive um, law, uh, material law, dangerous material law, which say after the end, at the end of each law, all of the above doesn't apply to any of the facilities of the Atomic Agency Commission. We wanted to do our own uh, inspections. We wanted to do our own radiation inspection around Dimona. There are people living there, you know. We found out that if we will do so, the person that do it might sit in jail, might, for 15 years. So we decided to let it go for now. But now we're taking, for the first time, we're taking the state to the Supreme Court. That will happen that's actually now in process. Now we, are, we finished writing the Supreme Court appeal and now we, are, we already published the Supreme Court appeal and now we are gathering the signatures, people to sign. We are also trying to gather some funds because we don't have the funds to submit it, but that will happen soon. We are doing a radio show on the only Israeli-Palestinian radio, but this radio also became illegal, called All for Peace Radio. Um, so now we are just doing it on the internet. We found an internet TV that is willing to host us and we're giving lectures. And if you think that this is a small crowd, this is one of the biggest crowds because for our little lectures, it's so important to let people understand that they're allowed to talk about it and to understand the dangers of possessing nuclear weapon without talking about nuclear weapon that we're doing our meetings and lectures for two people, three people, and sometimes even 20. But it's a slow process. Uh, one of the, th the questions that I was asked is what is the role or how can people that are interested in this topic from outside the region can help us in Israel? And there are two or three main, main ways that I think we can get your help. One, pressure. Just because we don't talk about it doesn't mean that you can't talk about it. We found out that using social media is highly effective. When we started to post about it in Facebook, Facebook is huge in Israel, nobody else talked about it. We started to post more and more and encourage other and ask other people to post and write and joke and, and really joking about things is amazing. You should have seen what happened when I published uh, just a little picture of a tiny, tiny kitten that was just born and said, doesn't this kitty deserve world without weapons? And someone saw it and opened a new Facebook page called Kittens, for, Kittens Against Nuclear Weapons. I mean, this, it, it, yeah, it's funny, but it works. And, and other people started to make memes about nuclear weapons. 
but it all came because we generated it again and again and again until it started to catch. Or else nobody will talk about them in Israel. But if you'll talk about Israel nuclear weapons, and not just in spite, but in a responsible way, again, no states should have them. It doesn't really help saving Israel. It, the, against exactly what are we deterring with our nuclear weapons? ISIS? They are a non-state actor. This is the new game now. But if we will not disarm, and this is very important to say, if the Middle East will continue hold weapons of mass destruction, they will fall into non-actors, uh, states, non-states actors' hand. And they can do whatever they like. You cannot deter against them. This is something that you should keep talk about. It is immoral to hold these weapons, but that's maybe not uh, what would change Israelis' minds. People that are working inside the UK or other uh, states that possess nuclear weapons, mainly the P5. The P5 and mainly Russia, England and the US are the depository states for the, w for the WMD free zone in the Middle East. What have they done to push it? And the answer is nothing. They didn't even have an agreement among the three of them. Push your diplomats to have an agreement to push for the talks. How do you want the states in the Middle East to talk about something and agree about something when the th with these three states can't agree on anything. Another way to help us, we're out of funds, totally out of funds. Every year we think that we're about to close the NGO and this year it is it because we don't have any way to survive anymore. Um, we have a Facebook page. In our Facebook page there's a button that says donate. donate. We understand now that we won't get any money from states, even those uh, who promised us. We understand that no one wants to piss Israel that much. However, people like you that can give small donations and spread the message can help us survive another month. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for a very inspiring presentation. I'd like to open the uh, uh, floor up to, uh, to questions to, to Sharon, and uh, I'm sure those of us in the panel won't, panel won't be able to resist. And my beautiful assistant has the microphone, <laughs> uh, and we'll be able to uh, come to your assistance. So uh, who would like to uh, get us started? The gentleman there. If you feel like saying who you are, you're very welcome. Norman. <laughs> um, what are the boundaries of the Middle East in your in, uh, uh, scheme? Obviously, it will include Israel, Iran, presumably all the countries around there. But I think it should also include Pakistan. And if it, Pakistan won't agree unless India agrees, of course, India won't agree unless China agrees, and China agree, won't That's agree unless America it's agrees. It's agrees. So it's a domino effect. Yeah. But it could at least include, as far as possible, Pakistan, possibly even Indonesia, Malaysia, countries which, um, by the most extreme stretch of one's imagination of the Israeli Defense Ministry, might conceivably want to act against Israel. Only if all those countries are included, it seems to me, could you get um, agreement of all the countries, including Israel, to do something about it. Thank you. I I'm smiling because that's my line usually. When I speak in front of international, uh, especially at the NPT and, and the people from nuclear armed states that think that they can talk about the Middle East and that the Middle East can be contained as if it's under a bubble, uh, I say it, it will not happen in a void. You have to do, you have to work on nuclear disarmament. That's it. Either it's a nuclear ban or nothing will also move in the Middle East. The thing is, People prefer to talk about the Middle East, and the Middle East right now has to disarm as fast as possible. We are, we are at war, we are unstabilized, and we have weapons of mass destruction. And this is a threat. I also think it's a global threat, but I might be too dramatic here. You're totally right. Iran will always, Iran and other states will always look at Pakistan. 
Saudi probably has a deal, has a deal with Pakistan. Everybody denies it, but we know that there was a deal between Saudi and Pakistan. Not that Pakistan will assist Saudi Arabia with building, but actually with giving them um, control over some of the nuclear weapons, ready nuclear weapons. At the beginning, it was, it seemed that it will only happen if Iran will have nuclear weapons. And now Saudi says that they're not happy with the deal, so they want to continue. I mean, it's almost like they're taking Netanyahu's lines about not being happy with the deal. But you cannot just talk to Pakistan without talking to India. And India, you cannot talk to India if you're not talking to China. You cannot talk to China if you're not talking to the US and to Russia. And there's no excuse for England and France. But you're totally right. What we want to offer is that we will start in the Middle East. And you know that it's just the beginning of a process. But the beginning will have to be the states, the, as, as you know, there's no real definition for the Middle East, so we choose. We chose all the states that are in the Arab uh, League, plus Iran, plus Israel, as the first round. But on the second round, and, and when, you, the, the, when the process continues, we won't just need Pakistan, we'll also need Turkey. Turkey also possesses nuclear weapons. It's not their own, it's American, it's NATO's, but we all know that they can take hold of them and that's how they designed, that these bases designed that the locals can take, uh, t take hold of them. So. Gentlemen there, while the microphone's going, I would just say, well, we need to be careful not to argue that because we can't do everything, we should do nothing. Yeah, and uh, I remember Geoffrey Howe, Mrs. Thatcher's then foreign minister, in the high uh, days of Reagan-Gorbachev disarmament, uh, in a very Freudian moment, saying that we shouldn't engage in nuclear striptease, hmm. that we had to hang on to our uh, weapons or whatever they were. Um, so don't discount the ability of momentum to take us a long way and don't think necessarily that we can do nothing because we can't do everything. Gentlemen. My name is Farzin. Um, I, I want to just uh, do a little bit of uh, reality check. We live in an age of failed paradigms. The militarist paradigm has obviously failed. They spent trillions of dollars and they can't even win a war. They lost in Afghanistan, they lost in Iraq. Their emergence of Daesh is the ultimate evidence of the failed uh, paradigm of, of military power. But I think we should also recognize that the activist peace paradigm has equally failed. We failed to stop the first Gulf War. We failed to stop the second Gulf War. We have failed and failed again. And we re refuse to recognize that the problem is structural, that demonstrations aren't gonna produce any meaningful results. And we have to go to the drawing board. The scale that is required for winning, and as Nixon said, winning is not everything. Winning is the only thing. It's so different than our limited Im imagination allows. Because we, we grow up in a system, and, and academia is a big part of this problem, that crushes imagination. And we have to move out of this box. That is the fundamental reason for our failure. I, I love the Israeli peace movement, all 20 of them, but please. <laughs> Sorry, uh, yeah. I don't know if to say sadly or lucky, I'm not coming from the academia. As I said, I'm totally ignorant. But it's very easy to say there's no way. And there's definitely no goodwill. No goodwill. I thought once when I just started the campaign that there's no goodwill from Israel, but the Egyptian wants it, and that the Saudi wants it, and that at least we can start working with the Arab state because they really want it. But I realized that no, 
the Arab states want to bash Israel, Israel wants to bash everybody, and Israel loves the status quo. I, I realized that the depository state, that the UN, you know, all those who I thought wanted peace, wanted disarmament, kind of like it the way, just the way it is, and that they're not going to change anything. But I'll tell you what I do believe in. Maybe not in the Israeli peace movement, although the 20 that are still there are quite good, and I'm, I'm part of them, so, yeah. But I do believe in civil society, and I do believe in fighting for what you believe. What shall we do? Say that nothing can happen? Then we are definitely part of the system. Okay, would you want to join in? Yeah, um, just to, re to respond to this guy's point, I think in terms of winning, I wonder if it's ever a good idea to quote Richard Nixon. In, t in terms of winning, it doesn't have to be absolute. You can have marginal incremental victories as well. So I think this point was a little bit, try and give a kind of more sophisticated response to it. I mean, you can increase the political cost to government of governments of doing certain things, of waging war in certain ways, waging certain wars. I think the peace movement, anti-war movement can do that. Take, for example, the way the Americans fought in Vietnam, completely different to the way they fought in Iraq. That was devastating. That was carpet bombing, completely indiscriminate use of weapons, killing tens, hundreds of thousands of people. The way they fought in Iraq was pretty ugly, but it wasn't that bad. And that's partly to do with the fact that there's a concerned, engaged public out there, that there was an anti-war movement in, in, you know, in the case of Vietnam and in America, which started with tiny, tiny meetings and ended up with massive marches. So you can have these, these, these little incremental victories that add up to something, and it's not absolutely everything, but we don't have to choose between total victory and total defeat. We can fight for something that's difficult to fight for, win a few victories, and that's something. That saves a few lives, hopefully. Such a happy note of optimism. I'll hand it back to the floor. Let's see, we've got a, another gentleman. Um, Tony from MEDAC in the UK and also IPPNW. And one of the things that's changed recently in Britain has been the involvement of students, um, or at least in, 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 in Europe particularly, um, in campaigns against nuclear weapons. And it's been one of the exciting, really revolutionary things to bring in this new young blood. Now I realize in Israel that there's huge pressure against speaking out and how difficult it is to speak out on anything. But I wondered whether you found any inroads into the students, and particularly medical students, who are ones that will really understand the humanitarian issues much better to be allies for this. Campaign. Not yet. Um, one of the things that keep amazing me when Ira Helfand, Dr. Ira Helfand came to Israel, he's from the International Physicians for the, Pref I thought the first thing I should do was to make sure I have him uh, meeting the, the Physicians for Human Rights. They're great, they're, they're doing an amazing job in Gaza and in, other pl in, in, in the West Bank. They wouldn't meet him. They wouldn't meet him, they wouldn't meet me. Uh, the Israeli left, all 20 of them, don't want to deal with nuclear weapons. It's either they think it's too big, impossible, uh, and scary. But out of the 20, well, actually the 20 that are left are now kind of joining us, even b mainly because of the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court is mobilizing people. But the physicians uh, didn't, didn't come to join us. Now, there's IPPNW Israel that has two doctors that go to conventions. I'm sorry, I don't want to say bad things, but but they don't believe that you can campaign in Israel. So that, that's a problem. And we simply don't have the time to do everything. I mean, it's highly, some, it, it's really something that we want to do, but not yet. One day. Okay, well, let's just take a couple more, and then we'll wrap up, I think. Let's see, we've got, we've got one here. Anybody else? Last call, last orders? Right, that's brought people out. Uh, one question here and two more there, and then we'll close. Um, yeah, you, you talked about uh, uh, nuclear weapons being a, a taboo, 
um, and the policy of ambiguity in, within Israel. But uh, I, I wonder what I'd like your comments on the fact that it's also taboo um, outside of Israel. Um, and it's certainly a, t a, a taboo here. And it certainly was a taboo during the Iraq war. Um, and it's a taboo within the BBC because you must be aware of the, the program about uh, um, Israel's nuclear weapons um, some years ago, which uh, following that, the BBC was carpeted by Israel and told they would have no more journalistic access um, if they made any other programs in that way. And I, I was very aware during the Iraq war that there were no discussions. Um, when there were discussions about WMDs, they, they were strangely truncated just when people started to talk about Israel. So what do you think we could do to, to explode this policy of ambiguity? We'll just take a couple more. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, what would you say to someone who thinks that um, WMDs played a positive role in, uh, in the world? For example, by, by stopping, by, by maybe preventing war between the United States and the USSR and between Pakistan and India. Great, thank you. And one more, last one. Um, thank you. Um, my question follows on from the chat there just from beforehand, um, which is the reasons as to uh, why Israel is unlikely to give up their nuclear weapons. So geostrategic position being surrounded, you said Saudi Arabia and Sharon now have um, access to nuclear weapons, will have um, the monopolization of nuclear weapons in Pakistan. There's the fear of Iran. There is the insidious nature of other states saying, yes, yes, we'll get rid of our weapons, but actually continuing to produce them uh, under the cover of darkness. So there's this whole lack of trust. Um, and although lots of people are very keen to uh, say that Israel is, um, has you know, committed crimes against humanity in terms of like the bombing last year, um, or even the threat of using nuclear weapons if they felt threatened enough, um, Israel may argue that Palestine have outrightly said since 1948 that they don't agree with their actually being a Zionist state. They live in fear, fear that any, at any moment they could be destroyed. So how do you propose that we overcome that fear and actually get them to the point where they will actually consider giving up their arms as opposed to, uh, you know, just going it blind and hoping for the best? That's a, a good range of questions to end on. I'll ask uh, Sharon to speak and then see if uh, David and uh, Rebecca want to give us uh, their two cents before we wrap up. Okay, um, about blowing the bubble. You know, the first, the best way to blow the bubble is if one state will probably by accident blow up the bubble. I promise you that will end the ambiguity and will go directly into a nuclear disarmament but let's hope that that's not what happened. What we did is to just ignore the, the ambiguity. We're not even questioning the ambiguity. We just ignore it altogether. Because by questioning the ambiguity, you let yourself being pushed into the discussion whether the ambiguity is good or bad instead of talking whether the bomb is good or bad. So go directly there, ignore it. I was shocked to hear that people don't want to talk about it in other places in the world. I was shocked when I met with the foreign uh, minister from uh, the Netherlands, and when I asked him something about his, the nuclear weapons, he looked at me and he said, we do not confirm nor deny, and I said, hey, that's our sentence. <laughs> I, was, I was really shocked. I mean, really, democratic states don't talk about it? You just don't agree. You, you talk about it. Put a huge poster. Uh, you have, you have a, a huge demonstration tomorrow. Trident, it's, it's like a dream come true. It's like the 50s are back <laughs> in the 60s. Amazing. I hope you're all Even coming, the right? <laughs> Even the 80s, yeah. You're all coming, right? Yeah, great. 
what about the Second World the, the, the Cold War? Weapons of mass destruction played. You asked me what would I say? Well, obviously I would say that you're wrong. <laughs> that it's wrong. And I'll tell you why. It's true that there was no big wars, at least no nuclear wars, between the two, uh, the two big powers. But they did fight each other through proxies. That's enough people got killed by proxies. That's one thing. I also think that just because there was WMDs and mainly nuclear weapons, it's one fact. No big wars between the two. Another fact, and that you can't really combine these two and say that it's a fact, that this fact and that fact are working together uh, for 100%. You had the Cuba crisis, but apart from the Cuba crisis, you had at least 20 to 30 times when nuclear war between these two states almost started and was stopped by a miracle or by a brave person or by another incident. Just look up near misses and you're, you'll get chills because too many times it's almost started just because of mistake, because, because the US and Norway were doing a missile trial and they sent a fax to the Kremlin, but nobody read the fax, but suddenly they saw a nuclear uh, attack or what they perceived as nuclear attack, things like that. So, you know what? Let's say that you're right. And because of what WMDs during the Cold War, they didn't fight. Let's forget everything I said. Is it still true today? I don't think so, for several reasons. A, now we know that you cannot have a small-scale war, but we know that by accident, a small-scale nuclear war might start. Second, you know, uh, you know that now, in the new politics, with the new non-state actors, too many non-state actors can put their hands on these weapons unless we abolish them and that with them there is no deterrence. You do not deter against non-state actors. And that's the, new, that's the new politics, that's the new game. I hope I convinced you. <laughs> Fear and Israel, it's a great question, thank you. Israel is afraid. It's not something that people from outside can understand but we are terrified society. You hear our prime minister talking about Iran and the Holocaust. You do, right? Have you heard about the Mufti? Yeah, anyone here don't know about the Mufti? The, the new stance now is that the Holocaust was, was um, incited by the Mufti. Hitler said Netanyahu didn't want to kill the Jews. He just wanted to transfer them. But the Mufti came to him and said, but if you transfer them, they all come to us. What shall I do with them? Asked Hitler, according to Netanyahu. Burn them, said the Mufti. Again, according to Netanyahu, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting here. Um, Angela Merkel, Angela Merkel actually had to go the other day, the day after, and reclaim the Holocaust. So we are surrounded by those who want to kill us. Netanyahu tells us all the time that's the only reason he gets elected, because we're scared. Nobody trusts him, nobody believes him, but we keep voting for him because he scares us as a society. And we believe in all these threats, but let's think, and that's something I like to do in Israel. I talk to people that come from the south, where for eight years they have daily threats of bombs. My, my ex lives there, my son lives there, it's frightening that you have 15 seconds to run for shelter. It's frightening. Our nuclear weapons helped somehow to the people that live under this threat? I don't think so. The same in the North. I know kids that grew most of their lives in the shelters, in the kibbutzim up North. Did our nuclear program help them somehow? We're afraid of ISIS. We can't do anything against ISIS. We're afraid of Iran, maybe there. But Iran doesn't have a nuclear program. Iran didn't have a nuclear program. 
or at least not a nuclear bomb, and Iran already signed a deal that says it will never have a nuclear bomb. Who else can we deter with the weapons we can't use that cost us a lot and take money from conventional uh, assistance that we so need because we are under threat? If we need to, detect, to, to protect ourselves, it's not with nuclear weapons. And that's what people have to talk about, but there's no discussion. There are a lot of uh, points to respond to, but I just wanted to talk about taboo and using the power of taboo to our advantage, and that's really what the nuclear weapon ban treaty um, will bring. Um, so it's about creating a taboo about the weapon. So after the First World War, for example, um, even though a machine gun had killed way more soldiers, people were genuinely horrified about the, the mustard gas and the way it left so many soldiers debilitated for years afterwards and the way it killed it sort of indiscriminately it would waft back onto your own lines if you um, if you sent it to the other to the enemy and the similar thing with nuclear weapons they're indiscriminate you can't contain them within borders within time so it's about the um, international humanitarian law basically and strengthening um, the laws that everybody all countries have to abide by um, and if you think um, about mustard gas and chemical and biological weapons, they have not been used on the battlefield in the 20th century, despite really some you know, uh, times when all moral boundaries seem to have uh, been vanished, really, in some of the dark times. But even then, chemical weapons were not used. They were used, obviously, uh, by the Nazis uh, in death camps, but they were not used on the battlefield because of the stigma attached to them. And when they were used in Syria, not even Assad's regime was prepared to acknowledge, admit that they'd used them. So we need to have that kind of taboo around nuclear weapons. They're even more destructive and even cause even more horrific humanitarian damage. Um, so yeah, it's about turning that, that taboo and even countries like Israel um, are, are not immune to the power of collective uh, kind of moral understanding. Um, they're not going to be the first to disarm, um, but we have to think about the global picture and the international regime, and the vast majority of countries that find these weapons completely abhorrent. And we in the UK have to you know, be on the right side of history on this. And uh, I think we have a civil society, we have information, we have uh, you know, the ability to campaign in much more easy surroundings than they do in Israel. Um, so we, we really have to, to, to lead by example, especially if we want you know, the weapons of mass destruction zone in the Middle East to work. We have to put our money where our mouth is and say, well, you know, there are global... Uh, there are You're going to put lots of money. We're going to put lots of money. <laughs> but there are, WM, there are you know, um, nuclear ban treaties regionally um, across large swathes of the world. And actually, let's just build on those and make a global nuclear weapon ban treaty. Um, and David, I think you wanted to say a word of thanks to uh, Tish Ryan. Yeah, thanks very much, Tish Ryan. I think that was a, a you know, really good insight into the difficulties that people have in Israel and discussion these issues, and you know, quite an inspiring example of the bravery of these people and their dedication despite some you know, considerable odds. And hopefully we've given a small platform and a bit of help in their, uh, in their continued work. Um, tomorrow, as I mentioned, there is a big demonstration in London about Trident. I would urge you to go to that. The stance of the British government, um, and this is true under the Tories, it was true under Labour as well, whenever they're asked about nuclear weapons, is we must have nuclear weapons because we live in an uncertain world. We don't know what the threats are going to be in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time. Now, it seems to me that that is a, is a recipe for never disarming, ever, because we're never going to live in a certain world. So what does that say about Britain's commitment to the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty? And what message does that send to countries, other countries that have signed it on the other side of the bargain, which means that they don't acquire nuclear weapons? We're telling them that we're tearing it up from our point of view. We're not prepared to fulfil our side of the bargain. So that, that march is really, really important. I hope you all go to it. But thank you very much to everyone on the panel, to Dan, to Rebecca, and especially to Sharon. Thank you all uh, for coming. Thanks.